awkward. Ha <laughs> ha. There we go. Okay. Hi, my name is Amanda Finley with COVID-19 Long Haulers Discussion Group here on Facebook. We love doing town halls and today introduce yourself guest. Yes. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Panagi Scalia Satos. I go by Dr. G. I'm a, an associate professor at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine and a physician in pulmonary and critical care. And um, since about March of 2020, um, I've had the honor of um, kind of caring for the COVID community in three ways. Um, one as a critical care doctor, so running the COVID ICUs uh, to begin with. Then in the outpatient world, of course, helping out with preventive manners such as uh, mass distribution to vaccination conversations. And more recently, this is what I think what draws me here. Um, we ran a, you know, we started a post-COVID clinic that uh, really has transitioned into, yes, post-COVID complications in addition to managing long COVID. So happy to be here with you all and um, we'll do my best to answer as many questions as possible. All right, it's gonna be, it's gonna be speed stuff today. All right, here we go. Question number one, should a person who has asthma and experienced a lot of lung issues with COVID have a CT to evaluate for scarring? Horrible cough persisted for four months, uh, continued shortness of breath, O2 sats dropped to around 90 at night. Yeah, so great question. And keep in mind, you know, we can answer as many as possible. I want to be thorough. Um, but I, I've already promised you, Mina, that I'll be back. So no worries. Yeah. Um, well, and I also want to, before we go any further, this is not medical advice. You need to see your doctor. Yeah. We cannot take live questions for this. Okay, go for yeah. it. So from my standpoint, if you already had a pre-existing condition prior to your COVID infection, one of two things will happen. One is you'll notice the flare, the, a typical flare of your pre-existing condition. So if you're finding yourself, you know, with your prior medical condition, you know what a flare feels like. COVID is a great flare for many underlying lung conditions. If that's what it feels like, yes, you probably need a little bit more extensive management for that disease and the flare to bring it back. However, if it's deviated, you're like, this isn't normal, right? This symptom is not what I've experienced before especially with asthma, dropping your oxygen levels with asthma is not a very common thing because the obstruction of asthma is really a CO2, uh, an airway clearance uh, situation. So what I would suggest is if there's a deviation from the norm of your symptoms, especially around a flare, yes, I think it would do you good to look at how your lungs are, both potentially a lung function test in addition to an, uh, a CAT scan to look at anatomically the lung tissue. So again, if you feel like there's a deviation from my normal symptoms of a flare, I would strongly encourage uh, a workup there. Yes. And yeah. talking to your doctor uh -huh. for a workup there. Yes. Yes. Your doctor who understands your history and full yeah. context. Context is important archaeology. Okay. Uh, I've noticed a deep but subtle rattle in my lungs, but only when I'm very tired. Uh, three years from my first infection. What might cause this? So this is tough. So I'm going to answer this question the same way I answer all my patients in the, the post-COVID long COVID clinic. The, the challenge that we are having with a lot of the uh, nonspecific symptoms patients experience uh, after a COVID infection are going to, and I'm going to probably answer a lot of questions in this way, really may fall under two categories. This virus, there's, there's properties to it that are not unique to this virus. And so post-viral complications, COVID is one of them. And so some of the rattling could be, you know what, this resulted in some airway disease. It could be a type of bronchitis that just hasn't shut off. We've seen this, it's not so much COVID specific, other viruses from parainfluenza to flu can cause this kind of stuff. So the rattling just might be mucus that just hasn't gotten out yet. And that would, would necessitate are some good you know, imaging studies and et cetera to kind of show, is there something happening in my lungs from this? A good scar could also have yeah. contributed to it. However, what I'm very mindful of, and that's the way I would have answered until I've discovered long COVID patients. Right. A lot of long COVID patients do describe this symptom to me, and we have tested them up and down, and we have not found an obvious answer. So I sit back really still very humbled by saying that kind of rattling you experience in your chest, if it's a long COVID symptom, I don't have a great explanation. Um, I, I have some other thoughts around the breathlessness of long COVID, but the rattling that I've heard from other patients that I have yet, you know, uh, to really biologically be able to explain. And this is one of the things that are it's humbling to me as a doctor, but one that makes us doctors, as we should, get back to our basics, listening to the patients, understanding this uniqueness, and doing our best to try to answer it. So, Thank you. Best answer ever. <laughs> <laughs> when I lie on my right side, I wheeze at night, but it goes away when I lie on my left side. 
Yeah, so that, again, that probably would still warrant um, under the recommendation of, a, of your doctor, potentially also looking at some imaging studies to see if there's anything happening to the lungs. Like a scarred lung, for instance, on one side, when you lay on it, it may result in kind of a self-collapse of the lung called atelectasis. It's not bad. It's an abnormality, but it's one that can be overcome by just positional changes. So I have seen that in some patients where depending on where the scar is, when they lay down on that side, the lung kind of self collapses. Now, if there's nothing there, right, and you're like, why is it positional? There could be other conversation pieces um, behind that um, that would just necessitate, you know, how you sleep and how you breathe, et cetera. So one other conversation that I'll add to it is potentially consider a sleep study that, you know, wouldn't so much look for sleep apnea, but potentially some of the breathing patterns that could explain the wheezing as well, if the lung tissue in of itself looks healthy. Okay, yeah, great. Uh, I'd love to learn more about how I can have shortness of breath with O2 sats reliably in the 90s. Everything is clear. What's going on? Yes, okay. So yeah. this might be a reflect uh, a long-winded answer, but this is important because it might, might transcend many other questions. <laughs> so the oxygen... Let, let, let me step back real quick. Your heart. Let's talk about the heart because it gets all the attention. Fine. Yep. Then you're like, oh, how's your heart doing? Well, you can tell someone how your heart's doing by heart rate and blood pressure. Remember, there's two things the heart has to do and has to accomplish a proper rate and a proper squeeze to send blood out to the rest of the body. Those are two parameters. And having a bad heart rate does not mean you're going to have a bad blood pressure and vice versa. The reason why I painted in this picture is because your lungs that create breathlessness, oftentimes it's never an oxygen issue. Oxygen breathlessness is really dire, meaning it's not just so much a, I'm breathless of it. People also have a panic and anxiety. Think of like being smothered by a pillow. People are like, you know, waving their arms because you can't get oxygen in, it's desatted, you're felt. So what I'm alluding to is you can have breathlessness for many other reasons that don't impact the oxygenation. Asthma and COPD is one example, right? That breathlessness is because they just can't get CO2 out, keeping new air from coming in. And if their oxygen levels drop, it's usually an advanced situation when they're in my emergency room, ready to have a breathing tube put in them. But they're breathless way before the oxygen even falls. The other example is, think of just exercising, right? A good Pilates class will make you breathless. And I promise you, your oxygen saturations are perfectly fine, right? And that might be more of a deconditioning, even if in extreme Pilates, you may not be conditioned to do just that. Um, and then I think of the diaphragm, right? Like our ALS patients, um, those with um, Lou Gehrig's disease, they will get breathless. Their sats are fine. It's just that their diaphragm muscle is not moving. So okay. breathlessness in of itself is a complex, uh, it, it just necessitates a good doctor workup to see what's causing it. But I will tell you, similar to how I put it with the heart, there's a variety of vital signs that are relevant to the heart to know it's functioning well. Lungs are the same way. Is it a muscle? Is it an airway? Is it the ability to clear out CO2? Finally, it's you know conversation of oxygen, but I will tell you oxygen desaturations rarely are a cause of breathlessness. It is part of it, but it's not a common one and you can have breathlessness for other reasons. Okay, yeah, great. I, I love that you said long-winded, um, <laughs> but I'm ching. Yeah. What percentage of COVID, COVID patients become asthmatic? So and this is a, a full disclosure. It's probably one that may, will not have a precise answer. So I'm going to give you my own clinical bias. The asthma patients that I have who have come in and we're diagnosing them with asthma now, meaning they're coming into my clinic they're like, look, I've been fine. I had COVID and now I'm getting short winded and so forth. And we put them through the ringer and we diagnose them with asthma. The majority of these patients, 90% or more, when you pull out their history, had a lung issue as a child to begin with. Maybe they have frequent childhood infections, maybe they were premature, you know, maybe they were exposed to a variety of secondhand exposures, meaning their lungs already were susceptible to asthma development. COVID just was the second hit. So what ends up, what I'm alluding to is COVID for the majority of patients diagnosed with asthma after the infection, there's always something else behind it that made them susceptible to developing it. Then, you know, the other 10% are people who, yep, yeah, you're right. There's no background behind it. And lo and behold, they're diagnosed. Now, with that said, asthma tends to be a grab bag word that oftentimes is, 
I will tell you as a lung doctor at Johns Hopkins, the majority of my job is telling people they don't have asthma. Right? They're just giving this. Because one of the other things that COVID can do is actually call some cause something called reactive airway disease, which is actually your lungs just reacting somewhat appropriately, um, but it's not a pathological overreaction that we see in asthma. So being able to differentiate those two is important because it does necessitate different management. You don't want to be treated for asthma if you have RAD, and you definitely want to be treated for asthma if you get misinterpreted as RAD, reactive airway disease. So with that said, the majority of patients with asthma usually had some underlying airway disease to begin with that COVID just became a second hit. Maybe they had childhood asthma, maybe they were exposed to so many toxins that their lungs were just, you know, they were clinging to the one physiological uh, reserve and then COVID knocked it out and tipped them over into asthma. So that's what I would say is, you know, know who you are as an individual. Do you have potential risk factors, family history of asthma, childhood asthma, prematurity, frequent childhood infections, because if you have that and you got COVID, yes, you're likely to have now tipped over into asthma. Yeah, that, thank you. Can we reverse the small bronchial airway damage? The lungs are remarkable. Oh, yeah. I love the lungs. So I'm gonna give an answer of a yes and no. The yes is, it's not likely that you'll probably reverse. No, let me answer this in this concept. This is still a three year disease of long COVID. So I have no idea what the future holds for this, right? So that's why I'm hoping fingers into his cross. Yeah, maybe it's self-limiting and it will somewhat resolve. However, at the same time, we need to be mindful that, you know, you have over 240 million airways, small airways. So what, in, and COVID by no means got to all of them. So one of the things that we have found in the right patients, I wanna make that very clear in the right context and the right patients, pulmonary rehabilitation has been advantageous to them because what we end up doing is taking the healthy lungs that still remain and just overcompensate them for the small airway disease, the uh, bronchial disease that you have. But I mean this, you have to do it in the right context because especially patients with long COVID fatigue, they can't tolerate pulmonary rehab. They get, you know, the fatigue is too overwhelming for them to get the pulmonary benefit. So it really necessitates us being very specific to the clinical phenotype of who deserves this treatment, because you can make, especially the long COVID fatigue patients, you can make them so much worse by putting them through pulmonary rehab. It's kind of like taking, again, my example here are ALS patients, putting them through pulmonary rehab, they'll get worse. So you just want to be mindful of that. So the, the answer is yes-ish by compensating with the healthy parts of the lungs. However, at the same time, I'm still hopeful that long COVID isn't a progressive disease. It's a one and done, but the, that one and done is just a horrible situation, right? So I'm hoping, you know, time will tell us if there's a reversibility, but there is an ability to compensate. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I suffer from a panic disorder and when I'm more anxious or stressed, my lungs feel heavier and with occasional pain. It's also more difficult to breathe. I believe the nervous system, perhaps specifically the vagus nerve, plays a role in our pulmonary function. What are your thoughts? The answer is yes. I'm going to, so look, one of the things I'm discovering more, and um, I don't want to put the cart before the horse, but I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a, becoming more and more convinced that long COVID is a neurological issue, right? Because if you're working with a team that's really sleuthing through this appropriately and not creating, not creating confusion about the terminology, because what I try to reserve post-COVID complications or things that I, I've identified a disease, right? After COVID, you had lung scarring. That's post-COVID to me. Yeah. After COVID, you got asthma. That's post-COVID to me because I have a disease I can treat. I try to reserve long COVID for when tests come back unremarkable. When the tests come back, everything looks clear. And that's why I'm suspecting this is a neurological disease because your lungs are getting a signal, an inappropriate one and reacting inappropriately the settings that you're in, leaving you breathless, leaving you like your chest is heavy. So that's where my suspicion continues to fall. Um, and a lot of it, for instance, within uh, the dysautonomia, that's what um, we call it, because we've seen it already in the heart. The thing is heart ha the heart has those kind of tests, the lungs don't, so more to come, more to come. Yeah. So I do suspect there is an aberrant response to situations of stimuli that you would suspect, look, if I'm anxious, you're gonna breathe fast. It's part of anxiety. Issue is, for many patients with long COVID, it's an overdue of it. It's an aberrant response 
where now you're feeling that chest heaviness. So you are massively insightful of what you guys are going through. My heart goes out to you because all my patients are telling me the same thing, right? Like that's why you guys get so breathless with doing the minimal activities where you could do before and now you're struggling to do it. I do think it's an overreaction, a, dis a dysautonomia, as we were saying, of the um, uh, nerves. Uh, and the vagus nerve doesn't impact the lungs, it's, uh, but it's still nerves, still nerves. C3, C4, and C5, right, coming out of the cervical spine. And if you want to know how to remember that, C3, C4, C5, keep the diaphragm alive. We like rhyming. But I'm a firm believer that these nerves have some level of a, uh, impact. And the vagus one, by the way, that's a good conversation piece. Because what's happening there, I promise you, is not exclusive to that. So anyway, sorry for the L-U-N-G, the long-winded answers. Amanda, this is why I got to come back. I love these questions. Oh, yeah. Keep them coming. Uh, they, and they, they will fire some good ones out there. Let's see. Can constricted blood vessel... Oh, wait, yeah, I just read that. JK. Uh, we might actually get through all these. Uh, can blood... Uh, let's skip this. I was recently... Er, hold on. Take your time. No worries. Okay. And, and as Amanda's reading, by the way, the reason why I've asked uh, a shortened version, um, we have Shabbat over our house tonight. So I'm going to celebrate Shabbos tonight, but I will be back as I, as I promise. Let's see. Uh, yeah, let's go ahead. This is a little bit longer. Uh, thank you again. Uh, I was recently diagnosed with small airway disease by a CT scan. They were looking for a blood clot due to the symptoms. D-dimers were through the roof, chest pains, shortness of breath. I haven't had COVID since last July. How long after COVID can the symptoms of small airway disease manifest themselves? I've never smoked and I'm not around anyone who does. So small airway disease also, one of the most frustrating acronyms of modern medicine. Um, take your moment to think of it because the other one is the seasonal affective disorder also has a very unfortunate acronym. Um, so small airway disease, again, it's an airway disease. Your asthma and your um, COPD, et cetera, they tend to be um, uh, uh, larger airways, right? So more proximal. Small airway disease is, as the name implies, at the most distal end. The challenge with those is they lack cartilage and they lack the ability to really um, be better controlled with um, bronchodilators like your albuterol to open and close effectively. Meaning at the end of the day, it just makes managing them so much tougher. This is what we were talking about earlier about the small bronchial uh, uh, constrictions that someone brought up as well. How long the symptoms last? I don't know. That's the part. Like a lot of other small airway disease that we're aware of, we kind of have an understanding of the progression of that that will take. Um, this we don't. This is one of the most you know frustrating things. Is I can tell you, I discovered this based on your imaging, and it's likely the culprit was long COVID. Uh, I'm sorry, post COVID. I just don't know the prognosis. And the inhalers are tough because albuterol also tends to really land a lot more in the uh, proximal airways. So you're not probably not going to feel that much of a relief. This is where I tend to tell patients trying out you know, nebulizers may be a little bit more beneficial because if, if you can try to do some good deep breathing, you can try to get to more distal airways to so kind of open them up. Though that's also time consuming as a patient, as I, and I recognize that from a nebulized machine. Um, I'm hoping as I come back with you all, I can give you a better answer of the prognosis because time is going to tell us, right? This isn't in our textbooks. I don't know how long this is going to last. If you ask me about, hey, small airway disease from certain autoimmune processes, I can answer that. Like, oh, with good treatment, three years, it's resolved. This, I don't know. And right now it's really just symptom management. And for most of my patients, if I'm finding small airway disease, the biggest benefit of anything that gives them a little bit of relief tends to be nebulized treatments of albuterol or a counterpart to it called ipratropium. And I tend to use ipratropium. It's an anti-muscarinic, um, sorry for the category, That's good. but it also helps if there's a cough component to it. Yeah, sorry, sorry for that in, uh, long answer, but you know, this is, this is the part that I'm gonna be very, uh, this is why it excites me to be here with you all, is that hopefully you guys, this isn't the first time you're hearing doctors just saying a lot of, I don't know, I mean, while we're finding things, I also don't know what this means for a long-term conversation um, and a long-term prognosis because it's a disease that we're all new with. Even the stuff that we've identified that we know, like a post-viral lung fibrosis, there are certain patients that that fibrosis never shut off. I mean, we've transplanted two patients to date at Johns Hopkins because of developing this post-COVID fibrotic lung disease. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot that we do and don't know, and it's 
still more in the category of a lot of that we don't know. Right. One of our group members put it very succinctly. There is no book about uh, long COVID. We are the ones writing it. You are. And look, at the same time, I'm here, you know, myself and many other physicians, we're here to be there with you guys, right? Because, you know, at the end of the day, what doesn't get robbed out of being a doctor is the listening component, helping to describe this thoroughly as we work it up, and the advocacy. You know, one of the things I'm most proud of is the amount of FMLA forms and disability forms that I filled out for patients because it's like, look, I can't get you a cure, but I can still care. Right. And I want you to have a quality of life back. So make sure at the end of the day, you all find that doctor or doctors or clinicians that can do that kind of advocacy for you because that that's never been robbed for me. Yeah. And that, and we thank you, you, Wes, Eli, so many. Thank you. Um, Let's see, and that actually, uh, another one, someone had mentioned that they'd had a bronchoscopy that was totally fine. And I wanted to bring this up as well, because a bronchoscopy isn't going to show the smallest airways. No. What, what's, a, what's a good well, way to look at that? So there's, and, and I know this because all of us are in the same boat, right? We want to make sure we don't miss a diagnosis after a viral infection that we can actively treat. Right, and this is what makes long COVID, amongst other diseases, when it's technically a disease of exclusion, yeah. since we lack a biomarker, right? Since we lack a, an objective test, it means with your nonspecific symptoms, nonspecific meaning the symptoms of long COVID are not exclusive to it. It means I gotta make sure I'm not missing something else. Yeah. I mean, the most disheartening thing could be like, oh, I missed eosinophilic asthma, yeah. or I could have treated that for you. So the bronchoscopy, while it won't show the small airways, what they're probably doing, my suspicion, isn't just an airway evaluation, but also a lavage where they'll put in some salt water, suck it back out. And what they do is just look at the cells and the cells can tell you, could there be a certain disease process happening here that you couldn't pick up from blood work, et cetera. So I've done bronchoscopies on patients as well, where I was convinced I was going to find a very specific disease process. And sometimes I did, the majority of the other times I didn't. And so a bronchoscopy probably isn't part of the complete workup. I would say a good lung function test and imaging is also reviewing the heart because the heart can be the culprit of breathlessness. Um, but a bronchoscopy, I would say, um, can be a good adjunct tool if there's a suspicion and a good one based on history and everything that something else is happening to the airways that we can't pick up on imaging and we'll need to go in and really get a good cell count. So I, you know, it, many of you may have been offered that um, and uh, to pursue, um, but that's what we're looking for. Again, we're looking for a disease that we can identify and treat. So that's that's okay. what they're doing. I think we've got time for two more. And the transcript on this is hilarious. Instead of bronchoscopy, it said Abron Cosby, like it's a basketball player. All right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, shoot, she scores. Um, <laughs> So uh, what are your thoughts on stem cell therapy? So stem cell therapy, I'll answer, and it is a promising thing. Look, I'm all about promising therapies and the biological plausibility is there. The challenge that I still, my reservation is, to me, it's, it's still in the research world, right? We still really don't know who was the best candidate from a disease standpoint and then what's the timing for that candidacy? Yeah. Right? So, because so many therapies, you have a window. You miss that window, it's not. It's going to do you more harm than good. And for certain post-COVID complications like lung scarring, that could be a feasibility. Sure. Long COVID, I, I again, I don't think that's the right intervention because I don't think it's a lung issue. I think it's the nerves supplying the lungs. So, I, I no pun intended. I'm holding my breath for stem cell again. I think. We will see it really be part of the care for a lot of patients in a variety of ways post COVID. I just don't think we're there yet um, as we still get more research done. Because the, the, here's the biggest thing with that intervention, you really need to be mindful that it's the right patient with the right disease to get the benefit. Because if you give it for the wrong patient, they're going to get a lot more complications. Yeah. And that's uh, one uh, some uh, feedback that I've heard multiple times now is that the results of the stem cell trials are not being quantified either. And that's a bit problematic. Like, how are we, they're just measuring with, how do you feel? And that's, it's complicated. Um, and let's, let's just shoot up to one last one here. Perfect. What are your, yeah, what are your thoughts on microclots? Um, 
I, I feel like I'm just going to copy and paste to some extent. Yeah. So I, I don't, I, I don't have any strong thoughts on it at the moment. Um, you know, what I will do is I can tap some of my colleagues who probably are a little bit more opinionated in it. Yeah. Um, and this is one of the things I want to be very transparent of, like there's during the conversations of post COVID and long COVID, many of us have gone down our own respective intellectual rabbit holes <laughs> in order to kind of see where this comes from. So this is something I can come back with and give a little bit more thorough because my one of my colleagues, Dr. Azola, does a lot more thinking on this okay. than I do. So yeah, yeah, come back, bring your friends. No, I will. I, I already told you I'm coming back. I'm just going to go have Shabbat now with my family. But yeah. and I really want to look. By the way, this is what's needed. Like what you guys are doing right now. This is what's needed. Bringing people together, sharing the conversations, bringing us experts on board, where you'll see the transparency and more. You know, hopefully, a lot of us have the consistency of the voices. But I know there's going to be some heterogeneity. There's going to be some variability because, again, where we're geared by is our patient experience. But if there's things about the disease that you know, I'm like, you know what, I haven't explored that as much. I'm going to be the first to tell you, and I'm going to bring in others. But just how I answer some of my questions, other colleagues are like, I haven't explored that as much. So well, keep doing this, Amanda. And again, yeah. you you guys are probably saving more lives than any one doctor ever could. Thank you. Yeah. And we and we need that very like, we need that variation. We need different opinions coming in. That's how we solve problems, not the same thought over and over. Exactly. So uh but and yeah. Thank yeah, thank you again, Panagis, Dr. G. Um uh, I'll send you my address for that baklava. Okay. Have got it, day. you got it. And for those who celebrate, have a good Shabbos. Take yeah. care, everyone. Great. Bye. You take care. Bye bye. Thank you so much for being here, everyone. Have a great day.